Welcome to Come and See, your podcast for finding truth in a world of chaos. Brought to you by Living Waters Abide Ministries. With host and founder, Richard Case, and co-host and retreat leader, Kathy Riccone. Today is our special guest day, where we will hear from a friend in the ministry who will share their insight and stories on truth in this chaotic world. And now your host, Richard Case. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, This is Guest Thursday, and we have a very special guest uh, from Israel, actually, Dr. Uh, and uh, Pastor Stephen uh, Curry from Bethlehem. Uh, So uh, he knows where uh, where Jesus was born. (laughs) Uh, And uh, we're excited, Stephen. Uh, Welcome you. Um, uh, I got to meet him uh, this week, actually, through a a mutual friend uh, that... uh, put us together and we had a great time together and started to learn about each other's life uh, and you're going to learn about a vision that he's been given and, and starting to be fulfilled in Bethlehem which is kind of wonderful we're going to share with that with the goal of having people uh, understand it and carry that on but we, we get excited Kathy and I get excited about people that learn to abide and hear God's voice <laughs> and experience mm-hmm. God's supernatural and that's that's what we're going to hear today so Stephen welcome uh, thank you for uh, for being here, and uh, we love uh, having you. Maybe you could share, you know, since uh, you're from Bethlehem, and you, uh, Kathy, you're going to find out that um, uh, when it comes to Stephen, um, he's like four or five different people. <laughs> so uh, tell us about who you are, and how did your family come to know Christ, and, and how did that develop just as you grew up there becoming a believer in in Israel. That's that's awesome. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Kathy, for having me. Uh, you know, as, as I look at both of your faces and your, I see your hearts and Rich got to know you over the last few days. Um, and what one thing we have in common, and that's Jesus. Mm, yes. Uh, one common, in, common denominator we have is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, and another third common denominator we have right now is we love Israel. Uh, We love the Jews in Israel. We love the Arabs in Israel. We love the people in Israel. Uh, Why? Because that's the heart of the Father. Um, And under in that bracket underneath why we love Israel, well, it's the birthplace of our faith. Um, It's where we call it the cradle of Christianity, Mm. the birth city of Jesus. Mm. I was born in Jerusalem, and I grew up in in the birth city of Christ, Bethlehem. Why there? Because my father started the ministry in Bethlehem 46, 47 years ago. Hmm. So I'm a local Jerusalemite. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm three or four different people groups together. Uh, the best, easiest way I explain it, it's similar. Paul said he was a Jew to the Jews. He was a Rome. He was a Gentile hmm. to the Gentiles. Well, I'm very close to that. I could be an Arab to the Arabs. I could be an Israeli to the Israelis. And... You know, the apples fall when they fall. So I can be all things up to all men. Uh, I can carry my own there. So I, I speak Arabic. I read Arabic. I, I read Hebrew. Um, so that's that's the language I grew up in. Uh, came to America four years uh, for college and continued my uh, uh, partial master's degree online. Uh, been in Israel rich all my life. Uh, my father started the ministry there in Bethlehem with the, with the hope just to bring people into a personal relationship with Jesus. It's not about denomination. It's how not did, about how did, uh, how did your, your parents uh, become believers? So when you were born, they were, they were already believers, and then they took you to Bethlehem for him to start this church there. Um, how did they, how yeah. did they become believers? Because they, would you call them Arabs and Jews as well? <clears throat> yeah, the Arab, Arabs, Israelis. On the Arab side, they call us Arab Palestinians. On the Israeli side, they call us Arab Israelis. Okay. Uh, I, I know where you're going with this question, Rich, because you heard me tell the story. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll share it briefly when you heard me the other night. I tell people we are indebted to Christ through you, the American people. What do I mean mm-hmm. by that? Well, it was an American evangelist. Hence, henceforth, Rich, you're setting up this beautiful question. So it was an American evangelist that walked the streets of Jerusalem 48 years ago, 49 years ago, 49 years ago, gave the gospel to my father. Boom. Mm-hmm. Now the gospel reached us through an American American guy walking the streets. Fast forward two years after my father's salvation, he's at the garden tomb praying. While praying, 
is about a group of 40 plus people there. Half of them were professors from a Bible college. So they see my father and they ask, what are you doing here? Because locals normally don't go to the garden tomb. They go to the Holy Sepulchre, the, the, the more traditional more traditional site in Israel. And they ask him, what are you doing there? And my father simply says, I, uh, I'm a born-again believer. I'm no ordinary local. And they started weeping and crying that there's a Jerusalemite there standing in front of them who knows Jesus uh, by name and as a personal savior. So they're drying their tears. They said, we got to hop back on the bus. How can we pray for you? And he just tells them, I'm, I'm asking God, give me opportunity to get my Bible degree. They started weeping again. And they're weeping, drying their tears. My father tells this. He leaned over to a translator and asked, why are they crying? These Americans, they cry too much. So, <laughs> so they're, crying, they're crying in their tears. And they tell him, we're, they tell my father, well, we're, well, pack your bags. My father says, well, what do you mean? He says, well, we're crying. We're weeping because we know why, now why God has us here. We are professors from Bible college and meet our president of Bible college. The president was not supposed to be there in Israel. was not supposed to be. None of them were supposed to be at that moment in the garden tomb. There was to be supposed to be somewhere else. Um, when they followed the dot, they realized it was a God ordained thing. So we are indebted to Christ for those two reasons. I have a selfish reason why the third reason I am indebted to Christ through you, the American people, because God gave me an American wife, Rich. Kathy, uh, mm. God gave me an American, beautiful Floridian wife who've been serving <laughs> life right alongside of me for 21 years. We have five kids today. She serves in Israel with me. So that's how that's how we got the, saved, and the and the gospel came back to America and went back to Israel. And here we are today, mm. the largest, fastest growing Arab movement in Israel today. Yeah, tell us. Um, you said you grew up in Bethlehem. Uh, you know, obviously, we we Americans we we know about Bethlehem. Uh, some of us have been there. Many many have not. What what was it like for you to grow up in in actually? Now you're a believer there, and and there's uh, primarily at that point was it uh, would you call Palestinians were primarily the ones occupying Bethlehem? Uh, what was it like growing up there? <clears throat> sure. So I'll I'll start off with this with two very important to lay down a foundation because you'd be surprised. Uh, well, I mean, you guys are in podcast. Nothing surprises you guys anymore. But I tell people, you'll be surprised how many believers don't, how little they know, Kathy, how little mm -hmm. they know about Israel, about the the, the, the land of our Lord, how little right. they know about the, the, the it, it, it's, you'll be, you won't be surprised, but many, many, many will be that aren't uh, traveling and meeting people. So let me lay down two, two foundations. One is about the land. So you have Israel. The West Bank, Judea, Samaria, the more uh, Jewish property, Judea, Samaria, uh, the United Nations, the global, they call it, they call it the West Bank. Then you have Gaza. So one country was split up into three sections, Gaza, West mm -hmm. Bank, uh, West Bank, you know, Bethlehem, Ramallah, Hebron, uh, uh, ancient Samaria, today called Nablus, Janine, and so forth. How and far, Jericho, how far, by the way, course, uh, by the way, uh, Stephen, how far? away is Bethlehem in, and therefore the West, West Bank from Jerusalem? Well, Bethlehem in Jerusalem is about five and a half, six mile radius. That's it. It's very, mm -hmm. very close. In fact, we tell people, um, just to answer this question before, we, before I go back to the original one, it's if you put a box on top of Bethlehem in Jerusalem, it's the safest, most controlled, most sought after block in the world. Why? Well, because Bethlehem in Jerusalem hits three religions, if I may, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. So when you're in the war and everything, most, I mean, very rarely we saw anything come in those very, on, on that square, because mm -hmm. nobody wants to touch that. And thankfully, right. it's God sacred has to us. many groups. Yeah, it's sacred to many groups. Yeah, that's it, Kathy. So thankfully, God had us there. You know, we are, we are in many other locations, but our main hub, our main vision is in that five, uh, five and a half mile radius. So it's about five to six mile radius, Rich. Um, so lay down that geographical location set up. You have uh, uh, two people groups there, Jews and Arabs. You break down the Jewish culture, Jewish uh, race in many different sections. You, you know, Ethiopian, Russian, and so forth. And on the Arab side, you have Christian Arab, you have Muslim Arab, and so forth. A lot of people don't know there are Arab Christians. There are Arab Muslims. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't know there are secular Jews and religious Jews. So mm -hmm. to move on to the next thing about growing up in Bethlehem, I grew up, uh, Brother Rich, in a, in a time and era where it was both. Uh, Bethlehem was under 
the Jews and Bethlehem was under the Palestinian Authority today. So, Kathy, I tell people I got to see the comparison of both sides, what it, what it was like to live under uh, the Israeli governance, which they, they ruled Bethlehem for many, many years, up until 1995, 96, and then they turned over to the Palestinian Authority, uh, the PLO, and now it's called the Palestinian Authority. So, hmm. our ministry, to answer your question, your, your great question, is our ministry um, it, we faced a lot of persecution, a lot of suffering over, over the, especially the 80s and the 90s. Um, Molotov bombs, attacks, and, and shootings, and so forth. And it, was, it wasn't easy. But we got to see miracles. Got to see the hand of God work. We got to see God's name be glorified. Um, just got to see a lot of, see, a lot, a lot of transition. I, and I'll just say this on answering your question about Bethlehem and so forth. It's the birth city of Jesus, and it, it's forgotten. Now, here's what I say about the persecution that we faced in the 80s and 90s, and somewhat throughout the 2000s, is that now many that used to attack us, literally, physically used to attack us, now they're sending their youth and their children to our programs. <laughs> hmm. so, so a lot of people say, well, what's the transition? Well, well a couple of things. One is they, they couldn't get rid of us. They realized that. They just said, you can't, you can't be joined. You know, I, I, I kid you not, this is what it is. They'll, they'll tell us, listen, we couldn't get rid of you, so we'll just accept you. And, um, you know, we feed them, we help them, we, we do outreaches with them. And they, they, they respect us, they honor us, they, they see us as part of society because 40, today, 44 years later today, we're still there and, and we're growing and expanding. So uh, that's our story. And uh, you know, I do have a personal story, but we'll get that into later how I, I had physically persecuted and so forth. And, but today we've expanded and grown in many locations. Yeah. Yeah. And so can when you, you uh, um, go ahead, Kathy, I was just going to say, can you, for, for those of us who don't know, you know, I, I just met you a few minutes ago. Um, you're talking about the ministry expanding and growing. I don't know exactly what your ministry is. Can you share that with the listeners? Um, even just, I know we'll get into more detail later, but in a, in a broad stroke, can you let us know yeah. what your ministry is? Yeah. Yeah. Kathy. So our DNA thing is a great question. Beautiful question. Our DNA is church planning, discipleship, making and evangelism. That's what I tell people when you cut us, that's what we believe. Uh, those three things. Um, our ministry in America is called Holy Land Missions. Holy Land Missions. It's our U.S. space front. It's our U.S. space 501c3. So we have a U.S. state site attached to the people ministry 501c3. But really, the majority of what we do is with our partnering ministries, it's Holy Land Missions partners with our ministries in Israel. Uh, what do we do in Israel? We plant mm -hmm. churches. We evangelize and we make disciples. We're always cultivating new ideas, new scenarios, new ways how to bring the gospel to people. So we do it by Beautiful. feeding the hungry. With feeding the hungry, um, we do humanitarian outreaches. We we invite people during Christmas, during Easter, during Ramadan. Uh, we host meals for Ramadan. And when mm. when when they go to fast, they, when they get done with their fasting, they have a, it's called a breakfast. So we say, we'll host you for breakfast, and let's hear what Jesus teaches about fasting. <laughs> so we don't talk about Islam. It's like, what does Jesus teach about fasting? We should just link the two together and show them that it's not about religion, it's about the person of Jesus, and we'll let that journey take them. So that's what we do. And of course, we have I love it. We do small, yeah, we do small business grants for businesses and so forth, help Christians stay if, if, if grounded mm -hmm. in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. When you came back from uh, university, what, what university did you go to in the U.S.? I went to Baptist Bible College, but I tell people, don't let, don't let that name fool, fool you. We are Baptist Gospels. So we, we, we believe, yes, we have the Baptist Foundation. We also be, believe that we cannot do anything without the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, that's kind of what we teach. Exactly. Uh, so you came back from uh, college. Um, what, what were you active in when you came back? Um, and then start to walk us through... Um, how you, how God gave you, you know, a bigger vision, obviously you were already engaged in giving it away, but how did, how did that develop? Uh, well, I'm assuming when you came back, your dad was still pastor at church there. Yeah. Yes, sir. My father's still till today. Okay. All the pastors and, and, and co-senior leads, uh, and I, I, I co-senior lead along with him. He's still preaching, teaching. He's, he's a far ball for the kingdom. Yeah. Awesome. So how, how did, uh, what happened when you came back? What did you get involved in and how did, how did this develop for you to, uh, head up this, you know, this new, uh, uh, mission that vision that God's given you? That's a great question. So 
um, I'll give you three quick snippet parts of my life, my personal life story, beyond just growing up in Bethlehem, born in Jerusalem all my life, um, and you know, and so forth. So, uh, I'll take it to when I was 16, 16 and a half years old, uh, when I had the privilege to disciple a young Muslim, um, and uh, after a couple of weeks, he disappeared. What happened was his mm. uh, his mother found his Arabic Bible in his room. So again, I mentioned earlier, for those that may have missed it, I, I read Arabic, I speak Arabic, I read Hebrew. This was in Arabic because he was a Muslim. And she gave the Bible to his uncles. He woke up and they were standing right above his bed. They unwinded a metal hanger and mm. they began to beat him over and over and over again. In uh, the beating, their request was to deny his love for Jesus. Mm. For three mm. days, every five, six, seven hours, they would enter his room and I beat him. Not one single time would he deny his love for Christ? Wow. And I tell people, the irony is he hadn't gone through discipleship 101. He, he mm -hmm. couldn't intellectually, theologically, philosophically explain, defend, or rationalize the Trinity, the Bible. He just, he just loved Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I always like to share right after this, I, I share this part, I say, we've complicated the gospel. Hmm. We've made the message of Christ, which was made to rip down the mantle we, we, we built seven mantles in front of that mantle that he <laughs> tore down. We made it almost impossible to come to Jesus because we made it so complicated to come to Christ. Um, it, it, not once would he deny his love for Christ. And, and what, how I found out about all that is was I was walking down the church street towards our church in Bethlehem. We call our Bethlehem church the, the, mother, the mother church because that's where we sort of birthed out everything out of that. I'm walking towards our church and I could see our building and somebody comes up to me in Arabic, says, are you Stephen? And says, yes, I'm Stephen. And I said, yes, I felt something burning in the back of my head. I'm talking to him. It was a distraction. And then I felt something burning. I went like this. I think it's a bug or a fly. And I, I looked at Paul in my hand. There was blood there. I turned around. There about five or six guys there with metal chains and thick wooden sticks in their hands. And they began to beat me over and over and over again, calling me names like infidel, and proselyzer, Jew lover, Jesus lover. And I remember... But I, when I said that, I, uh, when they said that to me, I said, Lord, get me through this speeding. I'll love you. I'll do more for you. And I, I don't even know if literally when I just don't saw a white blanket drape over me. And at that moment, I knew what it means to have a covenant father. I knew what it means to have a God that separates me from the, in the middle of the beginning when they, when they were beating me, that white blanket drape over me. I was at least. Um, Satan's desire was uh, the opposite of that. Satan's desire was uh, to uh, put hatred in my heart for Muslims because Satan knew that uh, how effective we will be, we, be when I grew, five, you know, a few years into my life when I started to, you know, physically, mentally grow, grow even more. So this happened around, around 16, 16 and a half years old. His desire was to put hatred in my heart towards Muslims. But oh no, it grew a biggest desire in my heart to love Muslims, to share the love of Jesus. So hmm. fast forward, uh, served a lot of lungs beside my father. I grew up in the ministry. Um, and I, I tell people, I was asked by Fox News once, well, what called you to the ministry? Or how did you get into it? I tell people, well, it's out of jealousy for my father, the good kind of jealousy, where I would see people come into our home, sad, broken, crying, weeping. And one, two, three hours later in the living room or in his office, they would walk out with a smile and hope. Um, mm -hmm. I said, I want to do that. I, I, I said, I want to do that. I want to put smiles. I want to put hope in people's hearts and people's language. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's, this is who we are today, uh, preaching, teaching, sharing the love of Jesus. And as we began to grow, God opened my horizon to a new thing, which we'll talk about uh, when we get there. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's remarkable. Um, and so um, as that's, uh, uh, you've experienced that and developing that, um, 
Talk about your personal journey of hearing God start to lay on uh, your vision that is your new kind of a new initiative that God is asking you to join him in his work. And, and uh, I say that purposely because I know having, you know, spent time with you, this wasn't something that you said, isn't this a good idea? <laughs> Um, I think I will. You, you, and, when, and Kathy and I teach in abiding. It's about joining God in His work and, mm -hmm. and and walking with Him and seeing Him do these supernatural things as He fulfills, you know, His purpose. And I know that's what happened to you. How did that? How did that start to come about for you? Where you you started to realize God was calling you to a, His bigger story and something unusual in Bethlehem. You know, this vision, which I know a lot of people probably right now are listening, like, what is this vision? Tell us about it. And we're, we're creating this eager, this eagerness here to, to mm -hmm. know more. Well, one, it's the, it's the vision to save Bethlehem. Not mm -hmm. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, <laughs> not Bethlehem, Texas. Bethlehem, Israel, the first city of Jesus. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. one. It's the vision to save Bethlehem. Uh, well, that path, one might say, Pastor, boy, that's a, that's a mouthful. How do you do that? Well, um, one is we are good at what we do. And by God's grace, he's given us a gift. He's given us talent. He's line, aligned people like yourselves, Rich and Kathy and others, and people that are brothers, sisters, partners, generous people to be able to be today the largest, fastest growing ministry in the country. 11 ministries in six different locations, which include churches, yeah. underground churches, a media ministry, a printing press ministry, a humanitarian outreach ministries. Uh, so and, and you, you can run with the last rest for 11 issues in six locations. So, but we realized that the enemy is focusing on two cities. The two hmm. cities of David in the Bible. There's only two cities of David in the Bible. Hmm. Bethlehem and Jerusalem. Yeah. Now, most Christians, Kathy, you tell them, uh, what is the city of David? Nine and a half out of ten will tell you Jerusalem, right? But a lot of Christians don't know that also Bethlehem is mentioned in the Bible as the city of David. Right. That's right. So hmm. the enemy, Satan, focuses on the two cities of David. Why? Because this is where Christ put the mark. Christ with the mark in Bethlehem, Satan tried to shut down Jesus by changing the rules of the tax registration. He tried to change the rules of the of who can register in Bethlehem to break mm. the prophecies. He tried to kill David. He tried to kill Ruth and Boaz. You know, that's what precedes the coming mm. of Christ. All the way to even manipulating the mind of Harry to kill every baby under the age of two. And this Satan mm. was trying to very much destroy the lineage of Jesus. Um, so... And then, of course, the same thing, he hates Bethlehem, he hates Jerusalem, because Jerusalem, that's where he was defeated on the Calvary's cross. So there's, a, so I went to Indonesia, I'll give you the short version, I went to Indonesia, spoke at a conference there, and there was a lot of Christians, there was a lot of Muslims there. Indonesia is the largest Muslim population per capita in the world. I'm sitting at this conference preaching, Kathy, I'm looking at the crowd, thousands in the crowd, there's a, there's a lot of Muslims. Mm -hmm. I started weeping, I started crying. Why is that? Why did I start weeping and crying? Well, because I'm looking out, I'm thinking, we work hard in Israel. We work hours and hours and hours to get the gospel out. But we're, we, we're not getting to that level of these Muslims coming to these church conferences and events and gatherings, or these conference mm -hmm. conferences, because it's hard for Muslims to come into a church building because of, of all the safety that comes with it. So it, it, the next day, I, I, they, had, they had a tour for me and everything. I canceled my tour. I said, I want to meet with people in power, and I want to meet their Muslim religious leaders, and I did. In my research, the way I found out is they teach the Muslims there to learn what the other believes. Hmm. Explore it. They teach it to them at, at age 15, 20, and 30. They, they promote learning what the other believes. They don't want them to convert, but they encourage, discover, learn what the right. other believes, and they the same thing with Christians. They teach them what to know what Muslims believe. So I went back to Israel, and I'm sitting up at maybe 2, 2.30 in the morning, I'm sitting up, looking over, looking our, from our back window of our, of our apartment at our church in Bethlehem, Kathy. I'm looking over the shepherd's field, the shepherd's field, the place where the angels appeared in Bethlehem. Uh, I'm looking out the window, and I started weeping. I said, Lord, what is it going to take for us to break record and to start to really get people to love, fall in love with who you are and to clarify misconceptions? Mm. Wow. And then... The Spirit, the Holy Spirit just came upon me and said, Steve, I want to encounter people. Hmm. Hmm. That led to us calling the vision the Nativity Encounter. It's not a church. It's not a denomination. 
what the Nativity Encounter is a, an immersive Bible discovery experience mm. where you walk through this experience, you get immersed with Bible information, Bible comes alive to you, people dress like Jesus days, there's, there's 3D models, there's speakers, there's touch screen. You're walking through these 12 different stations and the Bible comes alive to you. What we're trying to do is to clarify misconceptions about who Jesus Christ is. And that is what the Nativity Encounter is. It's, it's not mine, it's the Lord's vision. And since then, it's been a beautiful journey. And we'll continue mm -hmm. talking about this and I'll tell you how what God did in such a short time. Yeah. Uh, but I'll, 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 yeah, uh, that, that's, that's where we are today with the Nativity Encounter. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. That's a great place for us to uh, break because we're going to have part two and get into the depth of all this. Uh, but um, it's exciting uh, for Kathy and I to uh, learn and understand that, um, you know, you're, first of all, you, uh, and this is, I believe, how God works his will is, well, first of all, you, you grew up in Bethlehem, <laughs> mm -hmm. so, uh, and you're part of your dad's oh, well, church of you know reaching people, and you you understand the dynamics of it because you lived it out, and and you said it's very uh, varied, and you know Arabs and Jews and Christians and and uh, the rules now that were set up, and uh, like you said, uh, behind it was the enemy trying to snuff out the city of David, um, and so you experienced it all, and you're there, and you're you're part of it. Uh, you have a heart. And then you go to this conference, and God draws you to, let me show you something. Um, and I'm going to use your life to take this next step uh, with uh, something. And the, and the neat thing, Kathy, is, is uh, you know, it, and this is what, uh, you know, Pastor Stephen uh, understands about abiding. Um, he says, uh, what? <laughs> What? And God says, I, I want them to encounter me. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you already understood a little bit about that because you, you knew about not just offering a transactional uh, salvation message uh, already. You already knew that. But God says, no, I want you to I want to have them encounter me. And what we want to do next time, Stephen, is pick it up from there. How did you develop then? What did that mean? And then you're going to share with us now what it looks like, and, and we're going to actually have a little video that we want to share, because I want everybody to r receive it, and then I ideally take it back to your churches and think about mm -hmm. how they might participate in maybe one of the greatest world uh, situations that uh, we get to be part of. So, Pastor, thank you so much. Heavenly Father, we pray uh, for Pastor Steve and his wife and uh, his dad and mom and just mm -hmm. uh, all that's going on there in Bethlehem. What a privilege that you uh, said for such a time as this, uh, and his life was there, and you've called him to this m vision, mm -hmm. not to work for you, but rather to let you work through him. And so we, we look forward to hearing all it, that it means and how we can participate in that as well in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. This just, I have to say, this is such a beautiful story already, just hearing the beginning of it. I think one of my favorite parts of all of this is hearing, you know, so often when we hit a traumatic event, like what you had at 16 and a half, trauma can send us hiding and, um, and, and running for cover. And instead in trauma, you encounter Jesus. And, and then for him years later to, to take that same encounter and say, do you see in that place? What I heard you say was most people would have felt, you know, uh, coming against the Muslims for this. And in that encounter, he immediately gave you his love for them. And then to see that be just seated and, and watered and grown and now coming full cycle, I, I just can't help but point out how beautiful it started an encounter and he has watered and grown it and the encounter part is huge because he gave you a heart to align with his heart yeah. so i i just am amazed by it already i can't wait to hear the rest so <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today and um and if you have questions any of our listeners if you have questions send them in to questions at abide ministries.com um, we can't wait to hear more about all of this, Stephen. So thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you guys next time. Yep, we'll see you then. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Come and See, your podcast for truth in a world of chaos. Brought to you by Living Waters Abide Ministries.
Send us your questions and comments and tune in tomorrow for more answers to your personal questions about living life in God's truth. Remember, God's will is best and none better. His truth brings peace in this world of chaos.